understanding, and I was going to apologise for my Australian accent. But now that I've heard some of my colleagues speak, I don't think I need to apologise. <laughs> We've all sat where you're sitting, wondering what God has for us, wondering how God will lead us. He leads us in lots of different ways. Some years ago, we were living in Australia, I was a pastor, and the telephone rang, and it uh, was my second cousin. We'd never rung before, ever. We saw each other at weddings and funerals. In the months prior to this phone call, uh, we'd been considering uh, going to live in America. No one knew about this. Well, on this Monday morning, my second cousin said, after we'd dealt with the pleasantries, that last night I was praying for pastors and your name came to mind. I think God said, you're considering something new. I think God said he's got his hand on it. And I froze. I knew you couldn't know that. Well, that was part of how God led us to live in America for 14 years. How we came to live back here was quite different. Pieces fell into place strangely and easily. So be sensitive to the way that God might be calling you, speaking to you. It might be through a friend, it might be through someone at church, it might be through Bible reading. But be waiting for God to tell you what to do, where to go. If it's here, as it is for me, I'd love to tell you what I like about this place. Of all the places of higher education that I'd like to work in this country, it's here. For three reasons. Firstly, because of the academic integrity that I see here. As Calvin said a moment ago, you will receive as good an education as you get anywhere in this country. This is not Sunday school with big words. <laughs> this is proper theology, thoughtful, engaging, stretching, difficult, invigorating, life-changing. But you'll be taught to think and taught how to apply that thinking. So I'm thrilled a bit that this is a place where academic integrity is important. As an, as an illustration of that, we have 91 research students here at present. 91. Academic integrity matters to us, thoughtful thinking. But also what matters to us is spiritual vitality. It's not just good enough to have our heads straight. We need our hearts straight as well. We need to be, as Calvin said, in love with Jesus. It really does matter that you're passionate about Jesus, that God is the centre of your life, that your daily devotions are important to you, that you're a worshipping person, and that's what is encouraged here. We've had a tiny experience of worship in the last 10 or 15 minutes. We worship together every Tuesday. It's a great experience. So we really care about academic integrity, we care about spiritual vitality, and as good little evangelicals, we know that if we've got our head straight and our heart right, we're good to go. I don't think so. If you read the New Testament, it appears as if we've got to be able to do the works of Jesus as well. So our hands, our voices, as if Jesus was there for that person. So it matters to us that you can so apply what you learn that you can sit with a child and help them become a follower of Jesus. That you can sit next to a widow and bring the comfort that that widow needs. And that you can lay hands on the sick so that God can bring healing power to that person. So we care that you think straight, that you love Jesus, and can do his works, can represent him in all kinds of ways. One of my favourite, it could be my favourite place on the planet, is the British Museum. If you go up the big, wide steps at the front, through the door, round to the left, you know there's a, if you've been there, so be another big set of stairs and up to the left-hand gallery. In that left-hand gallery is a pot. It's ten inches high, seven inches wide. 
It is uh, the Portland vase. It was, it's, you can see that it's made out of uh, glass, cameo. It was blown at the same time that St. Paul was writing his letter to the Romans. And it was made in Rome. It spent the first, we're not quite sure how long now, but the first 15 or 1600 years in a sarcophagus. And then it was brought out into the light again. And it ended up in the hands of the Duke of Portland, hence its name. And for safekeeping, the Duke of Portland loaned it to the British Museum, 1810. In 1845, a man who'd had a little too much of the amber liquid uh, was visiting a museum and he picked up a nearby statue and he smashed the case around the vase. Then he smashed the vase into around 200 pieces. So valuable is this thing that they obviously attempted to put it back together. But the glues in the 19th century weren't good enough to make it look good. So it looked pretty ugly. So they pulled it apart, they put it together again, but still it didn't look good. In 1986, Nigel Williams, the curator of ceramics at the time, thought that uh, the scientific, the technological skills had developed, the materials had developed enough that he would try it again. And so with BBC cameras rolling, he broke the vase. And he, and he and his assistant cleaned the pieces. And they put it back together and they used all the bits and pieces that others couldn't fit in. And there it is. Put back together as if it had never been broken. The good news in Jesus is that you and I have been put back together as if it had never been broken. Or well, if you look closely at the vase, in fact if you look closely you can see some little cracks. And if you look closely at me you can see some little cracks. <laughs> but I'm so thankful to God that he's put me back together as if I've never been broken. And we'd like to invite you to join us to learn more as to more about how we can help others be put back together as if they've never been broken. I'd like to pray for you now, especially those of you who are thinking about should we be, should we be here or someone else, somewhere else. Could, I'm not going to ask you to do more than just put your hand up. Who is here thinking about is this the place for me to be studying? We'd like to pray for you, so just notice who they are. Put your, lean forward and put your hand on that person while I pray. Could you do that? Just put your hand on that person. And maybe there's not enough hands to go around. You might feel a bit exposed. That's all right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these people who are searching, wondering what you have for them for the next chapter of their lives. We thank you that you love them. Thank you that you've forgiven them, that you've re you have renewed them. And thank you that you've put in them a passion to serve you and to learn. And we pray that today you'd help them. We pray that you'd help their families and friends, that together they would discern where you would like them to be in the next chapter of their lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. So um, I would like now to introduce the other um, faculty members. So if you please on the screen. So as we met earlier, Ed Thomas Javier is our principal. And Tony Lane is the professor of uh, historical theology. And Lee Powell is the theology and counseling level five uh, leader and lecturer. And Carrie Luce uh, is the lecturer in music. Uh, Chloe Lynch is uh, the lecturer in Practical Theology. And Christopher, uh, Chris Gray is a uh, lecturer in Music also. And Jerry Dean Luce is a uh, lecturer in Contemporary Music Studies. And Graham, uh, Conrad uh, Gaff is a uh, mm -hmm. uh, lecturer in New Testament. And Graham McFadden is the director in Research. And Graham Tolltree is the academic dean. And Jeremy Perigo is the director of music and worship programs and lecture in worship. And John Dennis is the main program uh, leader and lecturer in New Testament. And Katrina is uh, 
He's a the Old Testament lecturer. And Kirsty Annabelle is a lecturer in theology and counseling, level four, a theology and counseling leader. Marvin Oxenham is a program leader in the theological education, director of online education. And right now, uh, is the program leader and lecturer in historical theology and church history. And Nicholas Sof Klaus is, <laughs> is uh, the counselor program leader. <coughs> Sorry for that. And Richard Hubbard is the lecturer in music and worship and director of Vivo Ch um, Chamber Choir. And Steve uh, Thompson is the lecturer in contemporary music studies. <coughs> And William Atkinson is the senior lecturer in Pre Pentecostal and Charismatic Studies. So um, you'll discover that uh, reading and writing and discussing are all part of learning. And so lectures are also very important here at LSD. I always spend a lot of time in lectures and sometimes uh, you know, we, we, we are listening to the lecturers, of course, but also we get the opportunities to um, interact with them and, and, and ask questions that we have been, been inquiries about. And so now, um, uh, just to give you a little taste of how it is in lecture, uh, Matt now is going to uh, give us a mini lecture on how um, uh, it is done in class. So Matt knows a lot about Augustine, the Reformation, <laughs> Luther, uh, Calvin, and Wesley, and so and a lot more. I mean, a lot more. He, he knows a lot of stuff. So um, but he's a great lecturer. So yeah, give it around to Matt. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome. I am, yes, I lecture in historical theology, church history. So I basically have 2,000 years of voices going around in my head, which explains an awful lot about how I think and teach. Uh, some of you have been travelling for quite a distance in, yes, a few hours have been coming in. So those of you with motion sickness have probably already taken your tablet, which is useful when I'm teaching, because I tend to bounce around a little bit, and I apologise for that, but I get a bit excited. Uh, I'm going to do a, a sample lecture on grace. I like grace. Do you like grace? Love grace. I'm going to try and stretch your understanding to grace a little bit. Uh, first, a few bubbles. Grace is very important to me. Uh, both of my daughters have Grace as their middle name. My other daughter is Emily Grace, and my younger daughter is Nicola Karras. So what did their Karras be? The Greek word for grace. That's as clever as I get. Uh, no, it's not. I married a chef. That's pretty, That's clever. That's practical theology for you. Uh, 101. Uh, so yes, grace is very important. Actually, it's vitally important. Uh, grace is a good example because it's a very difficult concept to really grasp hold of. Um, it's, it's very difficult to build the doctrine of grace. In fact, it was 400 years before anybody even thought about trying to think about building a doctrine of grace. And so we have to go back to Scripture as our source. Scripture is always our source, always our authority in these things. And there are two words, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, which help us to begin to understand grace and help us to understand how we've misunderstood grace. In the Old Testament, the main word for grace is the word chesed. Is that a reasonable pronunciation, Katya? Am I okay? Yes, Katya, Old Testament nature. Uh, yeah, this next door to me corrects me up my Hebrew. Uh, little Hebrew I'm sure. Chesed is an interesting word because uh, the word chesed is, is love that pours out of a covenantal bond. Acts of love. It's not simply love in itself, but anything which comes out of the covenantal bond of love, any action that results from that, it is a work of grace. And so, the grace is, if you like, a consideration of something else. So mercy can be grace. Forgiveness can be grace. Love can be grace. But grace is, is that action that comes out of the covenantal bond of love. Marriage is a good example. Uh, I'm, I'm bound to my wife in the covenantal bond of love. I keep telling her this, she can't get out of it. Um, but the actions that come naturally out of that are, are, are works of grace, are actions of grace. They're not a great struggle for me, they're more of a struggle for her, it must be said. But that, that's, what, that's what grace is in the Old Testament. It's very active, it's very applied, it's very good to pin down. Uh, and similarly in the New Testament, when we get into the concept of charis, grace, it, it's again, it's an active, stuff, uh, active thing. Uh, charis in some ways just means gift, but it's not a gift as in a substantial thing. It's a gift in an active sense, always. Um, it, it, it's never static. And I worry about what we do with grace in the church. Because as I understand, as I hear people talk about grace, 
it often gets quite static, and I've been trying to think about why that is. And I think it comes out of our misunderstanding of God, and particularly of God the Father, oh God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, in a lot of our churches, we confuse the two together, we blend the two together. And in evangelicalism, one of our strengths is that we have a very strong, what we call, Christocentric approach. Christ at the centre of all things. And that's brilliant. But if you extend it too far, then you can box in your faith and you can limit the faith. Because we have to recognise a right role of Christ, but also a right role of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Church has done in the last couple of hundred years, uh, if not a bit longer, is, is to box in our understanding of God to an understanding of Christ. Christ is everything. And no, God is everything. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have to recognize the right roles of each of them. I went to, to my niece's christening about, uh, no, back, about six months ago. Uh, and I, I, I turned up and uh, there was a very nice sermon given. And it was, it, everything in the sermon was great, except the fact that he said he was speaking about grace. And I'm not sure he actually was talking about grace at any point uh, in the sermon. Because his entire sermon on grace was about Christ. I, I, so the students here, they might have already bought some rotten tomatoes and, and rocks to throw at me because they get worried about my heresies uh, when, I'm, when I'm teaching this kind of stuff. Because the, the, the Christ act, properly understood, is more a work of atonement than the work of grace. And grace flows out of the work of atonement. And we are saved by the grace that flows from the, the cross, if you like, is the fountain of grace, from which grace pours out. But grace is what spirit does. Coming out of the Christ Act, uh, available to us because of the Christ Act. But the act of Christ on the cross is the work of atonement. It's the act which, which opens up the pathway between humankind and God. Symbolised by the, uh, the temple curtain being torn in two. So the Holy of Holies is now accessible to all people. That's what Christ is doing. He is laying the pathway between us and God. But, and again you're going to be worried about me, but hopefully only for a minute. I'm not saved simply by the cross of Christ. Because if I am saved simply by the cross of Christ, then everybody's saved. We end up with a doctrine called universalism. Everybody goes to heaven. I'm saved because as a result of the work of the cross of Christ, the Spirit has been poured out. And the Spirit comes and touches my spirit and brings my spirit to life. And gives me a new life because of the work that Christ has done in relationship with the triune God. Grace is that work of spirit. Am I safe? I'm not going to get stoned. Uh, and all of a sudden, you see, things get a little bit more dynamic in the Christian faith. Because if we put grace back to the cross and back to Christ, then there's a danger that our Christian life is done. Everything's sorted. It's finished. And I, I, you know, once I've, I've accessed the cross, then I'm basically sitting twiddling my thumbs, waiting for Christ to come again, and then we can have a big party. And in between, I don't really need to do anything else because it's all done at the cross. It's all finished at the cross. Uh, I'm sorted. And then, you know, if I want to have the Holy Spirit as an optional extra, as an app that I install on my phone, then great, super. Excellent. If you like it, you don't have to have it, though. It's not really important. Does that sound reasonably familiar with some of your experiences of Christianity? That's not Paul's Christianity. That's not Jesus' Christianity. It, it's life in the Spirit. Good example is when we go to the book of Romans, and we look at how we treat the book of Romans. Uh, Romans is a wonderfully complex book. At times I like it, at times I really hate it, uh, depending on where I'm fitting in my mood about how much I really want to work with it. But a lot of people, when they go to Romans, you know they've got the direct structure of Romans, uh, they end their gospel at the end of chapter 5. Chapters 1 to nearly the end of 3 is the problem of sin, and then Christ comes and the new righteousness from God in, in Romans 3.21. Uh, and then you have righteousness, and you have justification, and you have sanctification, three, four, five, uh, and often people then stop and say, that's it, that's your gospel. You're justified, you're sanctified, you're safe with God. And then everything else is, is extra stuff. That's not where Paul's going with his gospel message. The first part of, of Romans finishes at the end of chapter 8. It finishes with life in the Spirit, transformative life in the Spirit. Because I cannot be saved by the cross of Christ, without receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, who is then ongoing work in me, doing that act of uh, restoration that, that Graham was talking about. We have to understand grace also in light of sin. There is grace because there is sin, and grace overcomes sin. And again, our, our ideas about sin are, are far too limited. 
in how we approach the doctrine of sin. If you look at the Genesis uh, for our, our origins of, of a, an idea of sin, and that very often we put sin into Genesis 3 more than anything else. Uh, and we, we go to the Garden of Eden and the expulsion of, of humankind from the Garden of Eden. And that's what sin is, basically. Sin is something which is vertical. It's between me and God. That's what sin is. That's a part of what sin is. And it's always a part of every sin. But it's not the sum total of what sin is. If you want the basis for an understanding of sin in the Bible, you need to extend it well beyond Genesis 3, at least up to Genesis 11, where you begin to get some other examples of the nature and outworking of sin. So in Genesis chapter 4, you have Cain and Abel. You have fratricide, brother the killing brother. In Genesis chapter 6, early Genesis chapter 6, uh, you have uh, noetic sin, where sin becomes a cancer in society that spreads into every single aspect um, and makes God rep um, uh, repent for having even created a humankind that could create a culture like this. It's societal sin. You have Tower of Babel sin, where, where humankind is setting themselves up alongside God, uh, asserting themselves with an authority um, as if they're equal to God. There are different types of sin which are being shown. And while there is always a vertical dimension to what sin is, there is also, generally speaking, a horizontal dimension in terms of this world. Sin has an impact in who I am. Um, it, it, it corrupts who I am. That's, that's a part of who I am. And there are still those cracks that grace still needs to be worked. I'm not to finish work, but fit finish work simply when I accept Christ. There's ongoing work in self. Sin is something which, which spreads across society. I sin against you. Um, I, I receive the impact of sin, not only in terms of what people do against me, but even generationally. I am not as perfect as I could be because there are sins going back through the history of my family which have created brokenness, created cracks that affect who I am. I am not as beautiful as I might be. Strange that might need me to, to, to think about. And therefore the work of grace needs to overcome the work of sin. So yes, there is the, the one common work of grace that we all receive of moving from death to life, of, of being back in relationship with God. But there are other dimensions of, of, of grace which are going to be different in every single case. I'm going to need a different experience of grace than you are, because I've got a different inheritance of grace, and a different experience of grace, and a different action of, uh, of, sorry, of sin in myself. And, and each of those sins need to be covered with a sp specific work of grace. And all of a sudden, the Christian life becomes that much more dynamic. It, it can't stay still. It, it, it can't, you can't just sit on your couch uh, and wait for Christ to come again. Because if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, you've got the Holy Spirit bringing you back to life, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, then that's, an, that's the Spirit that should result in action in your life. It should result in multiple forms of action. It should result in sanctification. If you are a, a member of the body of Christ, you cannot simply go on sinning as you always sinned. Yes, you will always commit sin. But you can't simply sit and say, well, you know, I've, I've sinned again, it doesn't matter, I'm saved by the cross of Christ. You have to work against sin, it's the Holy Spirit that's in you. And the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is at work, will produce holiness. It's the Holy Spirit that's powerful, that gifts you, that works in you and through you. And we should be seeing the works of, of, of grace. These, the, what we call the charismata, you know about the charismata? Big talking point, you'll come across that at various points in your studies if you come here. Uh, the charismata, we always say the gifts of the Holy Spirit, yes? Uh, you've probably heard about these speaking tongues being the, the most famous one. Interesting phrase, charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you break it up into its Greek form again, charismata, gifts of grace. Not gifts of the Holy Spirit, but then grace is what Spirit does. Why do we limit grace? Why don't we deal with the work of Christ on the cross as the work of Christ on the cross? Majestic, brilliant, incomprehensible as it is. It, it, you know, I, I love sitting, I love, you know Christmas? I love Christmas. You can't understand the work of, of Christ unless you sit with the baby at the manger. Spend, the, spend some serious time in Christmas throughout the year, because the cross makes no sense unless you sit with a baby in the manger who is fully God and fully man. That's remarkable. And, and so wonder at, at the Christ event. But wonder at the work of the Spirit as well. Don't confuse the two, because the, the person of the Trinity that you're engaging with now is the Spirit. That's what's alive with you. Is Jesus in you? Yes, by his spirit. He can't fit inside you anymore because he's incarnate. He's ascended. I'm writing a book at the moment with a former student on the ascension of Christ. Something that the church has lost. We keep talking about Jesus is with me. Jesus is with me. 
Unfortunately, he essentially says, he's gone. Sorry, I might like him to be with you, but he's not with you anymore. He's gone. He's going to come again. Don't worry, he's coming back again. In the same way as you saw him go, he's coming back, but he's not with you anymore. His spirit is with you, but you relate differently to the spirit than you relate to Christ. You can't shake the spirit's hand. There's no hand to shake but the spirit. So we need to understand the work of the spirit in our lives. Again, it's, it's a different form of, uh, of Christianity. It's, it's relational in a different way. You relate to spirit in a different way than you relate to a person. One of the great theologians who, who talked about the dangers of our understanding of grace is a guy called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a, a German theologian uh, working from about the 1930s onwards. Um, he was one of the, the few people who stood up against the, um, the Nazi regime in Germany. Uh, it's a sad event in the history of the church, our, our response uh, to, to the, that regime. But Bonhoeffer stood up against it. He's probably most famous now for his, his work on discipleship. And he's someone I want to listen to about discipleship. Because ultimately he was, um, he was imprisoned in a concentration camp and, and hanged in Flossenburg concentration camp three weeks before the end of the Second World War. This is a guy who knows about discipleship. And he talked about cheap grace and costly grace. He said cheap grace is grace without a cost. It's the idea that you can simply receive forgiveness without it having any impact on you. Um, and, and I see a lot of cheap grace in the church today. You know, I, I sin, and I, I'm tempted to sin, and I, and I fall into sin, and I'm like, oh dear, I'll, I'll go and I'll say sorry, and I'll receive forgiveness, and okay, it's all done. Well, it says, costly grace is costly because it costs a man his life. It's costly grace because God, it costs God so much that he would send his son in order to die on a cross in order to overcome the impact of sin. If God is willing to do that in order to install grace in my life, then the grace, I, I need to recognize that the grace I receive has a cost. If it has that cost on Christ, it should have a greater cost on my life to overcome the work of sin in who I am. I cannot simply sit with it. I love listening to, to my friends from the past. Most of my friends died hundreds of years ago. Um, those who know me aren't surprised by this. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a quick, quick story about one of my, my favorite friends who, who helped me uh, in these times. Uh, he's a guy called Polycarp of Smyrna. Um, my wife's a very narrow-minded person, it's one of the struggles that I have. Um, and uh, well, the, the great example of it is, is when we're naming children, you want to name your children after significant figures in your life. Uh, that's one of the routes you take. And uh, for some reason, Polycarp was never on the, on the cart. Um, so it's one of the struggles that I have day by day. Sorry, who works for Polycarp is, is one of my great friends. He was, um, if you like, within the faith, the grandchild of John the Apostle. Uh, his spiritual father um, was a, a guy called, uh, uh, he actually was a spiritual son uh, of John the Apostle, because Polycarp sat uh, at the feet of John the Apostle, that's who, who taught Polycarp. Polycarp was a remarkable man. He, uh, he lived for 80 years as an evangelist, as a missionary, as a, a church leader, uh, as a theologian. Uh, key, key figure, served for 80 years, I think he was about 86, when he was finally captured by the Roman authorities. Um, and uh, he was given a choice. Either you recant your faith, or, or you're burnt alive. That's your choice. And Polycarp said, uh, my Lord has served me faithfully for 80 years. Who am I to deny him now? And he walked into the flames and was burnt alive. That's a, that's a cost of grace that challenges me in a number of ways. It gives me an encouragement. Because as a result of the work of grace, I am united with Polycarp as I am united with all my brothers and sisters, as the one body of Christ. And therefore, every day that I live, uh, Polycarp is with me in some way. And you are with me in some way. And that's a great support. I don't face things on my own. I cannot face anything on my own. I can only face it with the entire crowd of witnesses present with me. And that's a great strength that Polycarp's on my side. When I face temptations, it's a bit more difficult when I realise that Polycarp's with me. Because I tend to give myself a little bit of cheap grace. With some of my little temptations, I kind of say, well, you know, maybe I'll give in this time and I'll work a bit harder next time to overcome that temptation. And then when Polycarp, I realise Polycarp sitting next to me, and I realise the temptation that was put before him, and his perseverance in light of the most extreme temptation to give up his faith, I'm tempted maybe to withstand the temptation a little bit more strongly than I would otherwise. 
You see that grace all of a sudden starts getting exploded out of its box. And uh, it becomes this, this necessary dynamic presence within my life. I cannot be the same. I cannot expect to just go on uh, walking through life until Christ comes again and takes me away. I have to be changed. I have to be formed. I have to be empowered by God to do his works, because that's what he's saving for. There's a little taste of a session. I could go on for hours and hours and hours about grace. Uh, there is, yeah, Rachel is uh, nodding her head. <laughs> I think that's probably enough for now. Theologians, particularly as theologians, straight theologians, you get more of me later. Um, so it gets towards cruelty at that point. Um, but I will hand back to our hosting.